Hello and welcome back to my channel. It's that time of year again. Lena's arbitrary subjective opinion hour. Lena's top 10 books of 2019. If you haven't been here before, my name is Lena Norms. Um, do stick around if you want to. We talk about books quite a lot on this channel, but we also talk about climate change, existential crises, and poetry. Things you need to know about me when watching this video. I love books. I've always loved books. I read a lot of books. I don't talk about all the books that I read on this channel. Reasons for that will be coming in a video in January 2020. Um, however, I like to highlight every year the top 10 books that I have read. I've been doing it since 2015, so there's quite a catalogue if you want to go back and watch. And the things that influence my book choices every year are new releases that I hear are coming out because I get circulated a lot of press releases and AIs and information from other publicists from other companies. I work in the publishing industry and I produce and present uh, the Vintage Books podcast. So I read a lot of books for guests that are coming onto that podcast. Oh, and I also get hired freelance to um, go to festivals or go on stage and interview authors. So I did that at like Latitude Festival this year, Llama Tree Festival, and I was interviewing authors on stage and was just like kind of given the books to be like, read these now. I try and research books that are outside of my immediate sphere and I go into bookshops an incredible amount of books that I really love, I've discovered from literally just walking into a bookshop. Um, so with that known and, and, and knowing those parameters of what I was likely to pick, um, I think it's interesting to look at the kind of books I read this year. So let's go into some stats before I tell you my top 10. Last year I read 45 books, this year I read 51 books. I definitely started more books than that, but I have 100 page rules, whereas if after 100 pages I don't have to read the book and I think it might be pointless for me to keep reading it, I stop. Um, so I probably read more pages than what it's saying, but apparently I read 12,345 pages. Um, but also bear in mind that I'm currently uh, reading eight books I'm um, halfway through eight books. Who says millennials have short attention spans? If you're in any way interested, those eight books are The Uninhabitable Earth, A Rising Man, Midnight Chicken, Yes, I'm Reading a Cookery Book, What of It, Trigger Warning, Factfulness, Vernon God Little, Hope in the Dark, and White Fragility. The shortest book I read this year was 62 pages long. It was The Soul of Man Under Socialism by Oscar Wilde. And then the longest book I read this year was 640 smackaroonies long, and it was The Overstory by Richard Powers. Wow, I thought I'd never read a book that long, and oh my god, it was so worth it perhaps 2020 will be the year of long books. Other things I thought were interesting to check in with on myself on my reading, I don't try and prescribe what I'm reading because of my job depends on other people giving me books to read. Uh, but then also because, I don't know, I think it might be um, construed as patronizing or um, like a little bit, I don't know, I think it frames the way you approach a book if you approach the, a book like, well, I have to read this because um, I need to tick off my list of how many X, Y, Z um, writers I'm reading this year. I guess I'm worried that it will affect the way I read the book, no, feeling that I have to read the book. So I don't go into a reading year like I want to read this many LGBTQ writers, I want to read this many women, but I think it is interesting in retrospect to go back and check and see what happened and then knowing that general trajectory, um, letting that inform what I pick next year without being prescriptive about it and, and also noticing, which is even more important, what you're suggested, what you're handed, what jobs I am being offered, um, who is on stage, who um, is in the roundups of new books, who are on the tables in bookshops when I walk in, and also what kind of media I'm consuming that tells me about that. There's a lot of factors that go into it, but I think it's interesting. So, so this year I read 51 books, 32 of those were women, 62.7%. That's higher than the percentage in the country that I live in, so it's 51% women in the UK. Um, so and I read 62.7% women. Um, I read 12 queer authors this year. Um, stats that I can find on the population of LGB people in the UK, 2%. That doesn't see, I live in London, I move in liberal circles, but does that, does that stat seem, sound right to you? Does, does anybody know more about this than me? Um, but apparently it's 2% in the UK. Um, so I'm well above the average, I guess, for that at 23.5% um, of my reading was queer. And also the trans number is really like, even the UK like government websites say they don't have stats on it, but they're guessing between 250,000 and 500,000 trans people in the UK, which would work out at about zero 0.7%. I read eight BAME authors or POC authors, depending on how you um, phrase it, which is 15.7% of my reading. I think that could be better. White people in the UK make up 86% of the population, uh, meaning that 14% of the population aren't white. Uh, so me reading 15.7%, I guess is like on a par. I should probably aim to up that a little bit next year, just because I think it's a deficit in my education um, and my 
historical canon reading, having done an undergrad and a master's in uh, English literature in the UK that wasn't that diverse. And I read, and not to do with people, but just interestingly, I read 12 audiobooks, uh, which is 23.5% of my reading. Um, so if people ask how I get 51 books read a year, uh, audiobooks is the answer. So without further ado, pussyfooting around. Why is it called pussyfooting? Cats aren't subtle and neither are vaginas. Anyway, my top 10 books in no order are... That was a lot more flesh than you needed to hear that early in the morning, wasn't it? <laughs> top 10 books. Focus. If you are on my Patreon, if you're a member of the Gumption Club, you will already heard a podcast I have coming next year uh, with Kerry Hudson, who is the author of Lowborn, Growing Up, Getting Away and Returning to Britain's Poorest Towns. You will already have heard me rant about how much I love this book in another video, so I'm not going to go on about it too much, but it's Kerry Hudson, who's a fiction writer's um, non-fiction memoir about her real life growing up all over the UK, Canterbury, Great Yarmouth, um, Yorkshire, Aberdeen. It's it's so interesting and it really um, sheds a very important light on the realities of how one ends up in a situation like that, especially um, homeless, in poverty uh, and, and all of the other structural factors that make up um, somebody's life when they're living like that and, and and how it's not so like we can't we have to stop focusing on the on the hero stories of people who are like I got out of poverty by working and it's not it's just such a false equivalence between those people's lives and the reality and the, and the possibilities of of what most people live through so this is a very important book and I don't say that word lightly because I know that people overuse the word important but I have been banging on about this book all year and I know that a lot of you have tagged me in posts already saying that you've read it because I recommended it so thank you support Kerry she's the best can't wait to read more of her books next year I'm definitely gonna get onto some of her fiction I think next is Min Kim a girl a violin a life unstrung it's <laughs> look what it is is it's a book about a girl who loses her violin but it's not just a book about a girl who loses her violin it's about a girl who's Korean who moves to the UK because she's a child prodigy and she is so talented and her whole family move with her and it's the pressure of her um being a young Korean girl in an industry that is predominantly powered by, it's the fuel the fuel of the industry um, and of, of the arts um, in the UK is, is old middle-aged white men. And it's her sheer passion um, for the violin, um, what it means when she loses what she feels like is her limb uh, by losing this violin. And um, what it really means to be on the top of your game as a woman and and also so fucking lost and it's just so incredibly written i don't know if she had help writing this because not because i don't think she's capable of it because i but because i'm like how are you a world class violin player and also this kind of literary genius the way this is written is great i'm really disappointed with the paperback cover actually of this book which which makes it look like i don't know boring as shit <laughs> i went looking for it actually because i wanted to buy it for someone and I found it on like in at the back of the third floor of foils, tucked in with all the music books, instead of it being in memoir and nonfiction and being shouted about. So that broke my fucking heart. I just really hope that this book stays in people's minds and, and more people read it. Um, one of you told me in the comments when I mentioned it before that she's also she wrote an album about this book that accompanies the book and it's on Spotify. So I'm going to link that below too. I think it's one of the most incredible memoirs I've ever read. And we know that memoirs is one of my favorite genres. So the next one is animals. Some friendships are wild at heart. I've talked before about how skeptical I was about this book, how people had previously given it to me and I'd given it away because I was like, oh, I just don't like other people's perceptions of it put me off, which is like, oh, it's about young girls who get drunk. It's really like wild and crude and it's gonna really shock you. And I was like, oh, fuck off. Nothing can shock me. I just got bored of everyone being like, a woman wrote a book with shocking things in it. They get drunk loads. Oh, so shocking. And I'm like, ugh. But the movie was coming out and the company sent me this film um, copy. The film is set in um, Dublin. Uh, this is set in Sheffield. So that was the only weird, the weird thing, but actually I'm really, I think the choice to set it in Dublin um, set the set the film on fire. Like I loved that and I think it was a good choice and I hope that the writer had a say in that because I, I think it works in here, but visually having it in Dublin and all of the things you can do with the heartstrings of this book, which is 
talent, self-destruction and um, the need to fit in and not fit in at the same time and be extroverted and crazy and like off the wall. Against the backdrop of Dublin and the, the literary reputation it has and is just like, um, so I would really recommend the film, but I'd also really recommend the book. It's so well written, it's so well executed. Um, I loved, I, I actually spent a while um, writing down all the, oh fucking, I'll find it, hold on. You can wait, can't you? You've got all day. Good, me too. When I fell in love with this book, at the beginning of our romance, I like drew out the name of it and then I was like writing all my favourite quotes from it. Uh, yeah, I've already gone on about that book, but it's the, one of the best of its genre, I think, and I can't wait to read more Emma Jane Unsworth books because um, I think she's got a new one coming out next year and I'm very excited about it. Oh! Um, a Guide to Being Born. Again, I've talked about this before. These are fictional short stories uh, that all deal with a slightly magical realism element in them, uh, which is my favourite kind of short story. Um, my favourite one was the guy who wakes up, yeah, and he has... Um, a set of a set of drawers in the center of his chest um and how he deals with it and and what it means to him and it's just so it the premises are sometimes silly but they take themselves so seriously that they that it becomes like meaningful in itself and it's really clever like the way she deals with the absurd girl who discovers a ghost of a civil war hero living in the woods behind her house the teenage girl who feels like she's pregnant with an with an animal it's so it's just they're incredible if you're looking to get in short stories, I'd really recommend this one. Don't you forget about me. Uh, another Mario McFarlane book. I think every year there's been a Mario McFarlane book on this list and that's a tradition that I hope to keep up. She's my favorite women's fiction author. I'm doing my Miranda sex um, voice because we hate that term, um, but she writes women's fiction um, about uh, people living their lives and fall in love, and it's great. <laughs> um, no, they're really real, hilarious characters. She has got such a sharp wit as a writer. Uh, I listened to this in an audiobook, and the narrator was great. It's about a girl called Georgina who's turning 30-ish, and she um, uh, loses her job, has a bit of a life crisis. The first job she's offered is a barmaid in a new pub that's opening, and she's like, yes, I will take that. Turns out, the guy who hired her is the brother of the guy that she used to date in high school and she fucked that up real bad and he's back and he's hot and he's Irish. I like that these books um, are also always have an element of, of friendship and family and, and the, the main character is always negotiating how that intersects with the relationships and it's not just about getting the guy or like falling in love. It's about like self-respect and dignity and saying sorry and um, finding your talents and knowing your place in the world. And um, it's just that they're just always a masterpiece. Mario McFarlane, five ever. Fun fact, also the only author ever that I've read all of the works of. Yeah, or like any, think of any author I've ever mentioned before, never read all of their works. Mario McFarlane, read every single fucking one, haven't I? Uh, pre-ordered the new one coming out on the 1st of January to download automatically to my Kindle, haven't I? Yeah. <laughs> On Wedding Toasts I'll Never Give by Ada Calhoun. Um, also an audiobook, a beautiful one. Sometimes I find American accents in audiobooks quite formal, but this is an, uh, an amazing audiobook w with an American um, voice and it's just so soothing and great to listen to and really deep and really well articulated and um, it just works, I don't know, it's just a book that works really well in audio form and the audio narrator is really great. I have listened to this audiobook three times because um, I love it and it's a it's a place of sanctuary for me. And it's weird because I, I used to be engaged and I broke it off and I don't really think I ever really want to get married. It's not like the wedding part of it is really so much time to, tied to religion at this point for me that I'm a bit like, no thank you. But what it's really about, and I like the title, it's catchy, but what it's really about is long-term relationships. Like why why um, they are absolutely terrifying, why they are uh, hard for some people to commit to and what gets in the way for some people, um, wh why they're important, what's worth it about them, all of the, the misconceptions about them and, and what's beautiful about them and, and what um, the, she refers to writers and parts of history and she brings in all this other stuff and they're like short essays and they're just good. Um, and it's really just about the human experience of being vulnerable, admitting that the person that you love the most will probably see the worst side of you and the dichotomy with that and how painful that is. Um, and it's just so, it's just so, I don't, I don't know guys, I've, I've, I've read this in previous years and it never made it into the top 10 and then I read it this year and I was like, why don't I ever give this book the credit it is due? It's clearly a masterpiece. Normal People, I've talked about before. Um, I loved this and I really did not get on with conversations with friends. And again, we don't like to bash books on this channel, so I've probably only said that once, but 
conversations with friends fuck me did not enjoy and then read normal people and was like incredible so i feel like these two books are chalk and cheese like i feel like people i meet like one or the other they're so different um normal people uh is just a place to come home to it's a it's a quiet beautiful love story about class and growing up in ireland and and um how how power dynamics between people change over the years and how painful it is to be in love when you're young and how painful it is to be in love at uni and how painful love is and ah oh, is it cried so much yeah i think next year i also just i'm realizing my own um reading news res resolutions as i'm doing this i want to read more irish writers um I clearly love them. I also find it heartbreaking to watch the the um, Irish charts versus the UK charts because it's so clear. Nobody from the UK... Well, people from the UK read very few Irish authors and I think that's bullshit. Um, and also, um, I Irish Irish audiences read Irish authors almost exclusively. Um, uh, well, according to the charts anyway. <laughs> but it's really interesting like how much they get behind their own authors. And I'm sure that does impinge on like people's worldview as well, like not having like that much diversity in their... Um, charts but it's also just I've never seen a country get behind their own authors that much I should be as somebody who has an Irish passport has an Irish mum and lives in um, Britain I should be fucking reading some more this is not a drill I promised you a whole video on this book and I'll do it um the selection of essays in this book is great I bought four copies of this book and gave them away to people in my hometown when I went back for Christmas don't know how that went down because they didn't open them in front of me but sorry to be a downer guys and give you all a book about climate change for Christmas <laughs> Um, but it's a really great starter um, thing that has like lots of gentle essays in it as well as just like oh my god the facts are terrifying um, it's really diverse as well like I like the amount of like voices from all over the world I especially found the essays on uh, the Native American impact on the climate change um, movement really um, insightful and interesting and I think this is really really well done and I'll be talking more about it in another video because if you're too scared to read about climate change I'll do it for you. The next one is This Green and Pleasant Land by Aisha Malik. Now, Aisha Malik, oh, um, she was a guest on the channel. Um, I loved Sophia Khan is Not Obliged. Um, she is an incredible men's fiction author. I mean, I, I guess what we can say when, when, I, when I express the genre they've been put in, what I'm really saying is, has a fucking happy end, okay? <laughs> As do many literary books. Um, uh, I mean, you never know what kind of happy and, you know, that's the kind of deal that you go into as an author with an audience is that, like, we will end this book happily. You can tell by the cover and the shelving mark, um, but but you won't, it won't be the one that you want, it'll be the one that you need. And I like that. Anyway, um, this is a book about Bilal and Miriam, who are a couple that live in a place called Babel's End, which is a very small, um, proper propering proper english village um and they've lived there for like eight years culturally muslim but but they both don't um at the beginning of the book have any religious beliefs they're both like quite agnostic about um their muslim heritage and um, bilal's mum dies and um on her deathbed she reaches uh, out to bilal and is like bilal you must build a mosque in babel's end and he's like Oh God, because he has spent eight years in this village. He feels like he's fitting in and he feels like any assertion of his uh, difference or his um, um, race or religion is gonna teeter that over the edge. And also just looking at Babel's end, he's like, a mosque is could not happen here and and everyone is gonna be mad. And he um, dismisses it for a long time. This is all happens in the first like 10 pages of the book. He dismisses it for a long time. And his mum was quite eccentric and before she died, uh, she'd go into her garden and build and, and dig a grave for herself, uh, climb into the grave and lie in it because it, it, she said it made her feel like more at one with the world and more at peace with her future and stuff. And he always thought that she was like barking. And then um, after she's died, he goes into the garden, he digs himself a grave and he lies in it for a while. And then Miriam's like, oh my God, Bilal, you're actually losing it. And he's like, leave me alone, Miriam. And then he's like, I'm gonna build a mosque. And she's like, please no, don't do this. And he's like, I'm gonna do it. Um, so he goes to the parish meeting um, uh, with all of the people that he's been friends with for years. And is like, so I'm gonna, I wanna build a mosque. What do you think about that? I haven't heard them as enough about this book. It's an incredible premise. It's so good. It's so well executed. The premise, the whole of the rest of the story leads up to the incredible premise. It's so funny. It's so, it has this really like awkward humour about it. Aisha Malik does this great job 
of of like somehow everybody in the book is fighting everyone in the book is in conflict everyone in the book is annoying but also at the same time you're like i'm rooting for every single one of these characters like i want them all to be okay I'm, it's not like a us versus them evil thing it's a 360 walk around all these characters heads it's told from um everyone's perspectives like Shelley who's the fussy um older lady in the village who likes to get petitions together and and cut other people's hedges back when they're not perfect it, it's told from the vicar's perspective how the vicar feels about it and actually the vicar being the main driving force behind um saying yes to the mosque and being like we should have a mosque the things that he's going through in his life the class barriers in the village like the the the, the pain that's already gone on with that and uh so good this book needs more people reading it more of this more more books like this um please i share and also everyone more books like this um and then finally i'm gonna have a swig of water because i need the energy to tell you about it oh my god i said there was no order to these books but fuck me the time's come to talk about the other story by richard powers i spent most of the year reading this book it's 640 pages long it's told from like nine perspectives it's kind of about trees and it shouldn't work and it is just one of the best books i've ever read i interviewed richard powers um i was meant to leave a link to it below but when i met him i was just like dude like do you know your power do you know what you do you even do you even understand like richard powers is this tall softly spoken terribly polite considered um quiet man who lives in the forest on his own halfway through writing this book he moved to the redwoods to live in in the trees because he was like I just need to be near the trees man the book is about nine people uh who all start off not giving a shit about trees or not understanding the importance of them and how intrinsic they are to everybody's life don't know why i'm doing this maybe it's for emphasis do you feel emphasized the book is kind of, like i was saying to him in the interview i was like did you mean to do this it's kind of like the book is rings of a tree and it's not all chronological, although most of it is, but it's rings of the tree into character, into story, into plot, and it's kind of like this. And I don't know how to explain it, but that's how it feels. It doesn't feel like you're going through a book linearly. It feels like you're being drilled into a book slowly while spinning. One of the characters is an artist who inherits hundreds of um, pictures of a tree that's been taken by his his um, ancestors over the generations party animal undergraduate who gets electrocuted and um finds out how much she cares about trees the, a female scientist that learns a lot more about trees in her career and nobody believes her uh, so she spends like 10 years being shunned by the science community because nobody believes all of the amazing things she's learned about trees an air force guy who's in the vietnam war and is injured and gets saved by a tree and i don't want this to sound hippie because i think there's also a trap here where culture has gone tree huggers that's funny it's funny to hug trees um and it's all about the radicalization of these people in the eyes of of the rest of the world and and their discovery of how connected they are to each other as you slowly learn through the plot you crafty richard i mean everybody loves this book this book has got amazing reviews margaret atwood tim winton and patch it i was underlining i think i'm gonna reread this book this year so <laughs> enjoy that uh it'll probably be on next year's list as well i underlined like pretty much everything um for a christmas present for my mum, my brother and my dad i bought i dedicated a tree to them all for, in, through the woodland trust um and and then gave them this book and was like i just really think you need to read it i think it might be like the moby dick of our generation because moby dick weren't that famous when it first came out and this is pretty you know it's pretty people have heard of it but it hasn't like it's gonna i feel like you need to read this now because it's going to be one of the pillars of literature that like our world is remembered for if we're around to remember it <laughs> send it up it's a game changer for me it was it's a game it refocused my whole thought process i have doing i'm mo definitely going to focus on trees in the future when i'm thinking about my activism i'm definitely going to make it more of a center central part of how i think about the world i don't want you to think that it's about science or trees because it's not it's about character it's about these incredible characters also richard powers has written women better than i could write women better than anyone like how has he done that um I don't know. If you want to be convinced, I think you should listen to the interview I did with him on the Vintage Podcast. I'll link, link that below. Um, but I genuinely think this is one to watch. And like, you know when you're reading something and you're just like, I'm never going to write this well. Like, it actually changed the way I was writing my book because I was like, I need to set my game up. It also doesn't matter if it takes you a long time. I read this very fleetingly uh, when I interviewed him. Like, I read it really fast because I didn't get much 
like warning that I was going to interview him. So I read it over a couple of days. Um, but then I knew that I wanted to come back to it. And then I took about eight months to read it. Like I took it real slow and that's totally fine. And it's so well written and the characters are so well rounded that you can leave it for a few weeks and pick it back up and you know the characters still. Um, and you'll think about it in between reading it as well. So don't feel like if you're picking up this book, don't feel like, oh my God, I can't read that. It's too long. Like think this is a book that I, I want to exist around and then like just have it around. And it, <sighs> anyway, so yeah, that's the overstory. Um, suffice to say, I think you should read it times of the essence i'll leave you with that so those are my top 10 books i'm actually exhausted okay those are my top 10 books of 2019 it's been a great reading year i've had some pants books but mainly it's been a great reading year if you have any suggestions about um videos you want me to make about books and like what kind of books you want me to discuss or what like what you want to hear about my reading um let me know in the comments below because i'm planning 2020 videos right now um Thank you so much for watching. If you want to follow me on Goodreads, you can become a Gumption Club member because I let all of my Gumption Club friends follow me on Goodreads so you can see everything of what I've read this year uh, and like keep up my reading and, and how I'm getting on and chat to me about books on Goodreads. You can also join the Gumption Club in general where there's like a secret Facebook group and um, secret podcasts and lots of other things going on. Um, so check that out. I look forward to 2020, especially for the Positive Panic episodes. Um, and uh, I will see you very soon. Frog Snog out.